How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Various things become clear when we read this one sentence from Paul's letter to the Romans. First of all, we cannot bring the good news to people while sitting in our offices, living rooms, or in the basement all alone. Feet are needed to bring the good news. We need to at least stand if we're able, but really we need to walk or roll if we use a wheelchair for transportation. We bring the good news by using our feet, our beautiful feet. Don't we take our feet for granted far too often? Isn't it quite the miracle that our feet can carry us for miles and miles? They help us keep our balance and they keep us grounded on the equally beautiful and undervalued earth on which we stand. The following is especially for all wheelchair users among us. Did you know that wheels are highly valued in the Bible? The Ophanim wheels are connected to the heavenly beings called cherubim in Ezekiel's prophetic vision. Ophanim and cherubim carry God's throne. They are a preferred means of transportation in heaven. But wheels are also helpful on earth, just like feet are. How beautiful are the feet and wheels of those who bring the good news. Clearly, we need to go to someone to bring them the good news. It's not enough to just holler over the fence, hey, neighbor, God loves you no matter what. No, <laughs> we need to make an effort. Walk to the fence, at least maybe bring some cookies. Definitely bring some time to really check in with that person. There is no way around it. The good news builds relationships. The good news is built on relationships. Why else would Jesus give us the great commandment in a threefold relational way? Love God, love self, love neighbor. Unfortunately, life in America today does not naturally lean into good news sharing the way our elders imagined it. We are busy, busy, busy. Our great commandment is work until you drop. We work for money, we work for recognition, for self-fulfillment, we work for belonging. Our whole identity is geared toward work. Work is at the center of who we are and what we do, and our children, they work too. Not necessarily for money, but for learning, development, enrichment, superb college applications, and to keep them busy and out of trouble. No wonder that church is full of retired people. Make no mistake, they are busy too with volunteering and babysitting. But they at least have enough time to sometimes take a breather and to set Sunday morning aside for church. Phew, but the middle-aged people with family, they are so relieved when they can close the door late in the evening for just a tiny moment of peace and quiet. The thought of walking to the fence with a plate full of cookies to check in with their neighbor might be the furthest thing from their mind. And Sunday morning, Soccer tournaments, brunch with friends, sick children, a good book, fight with partners, sleep in, care for aging mother, pay the bills, work. There are so many things screaming on a Sunday morning. Look at me. I want your attention. But here's the problem with that. How are you going to fulfill your calling as a Christian if you don't have any time? How are you going to put faith front and center? How will you, as Paul writes, believe with the heart and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord? How will you believe in one of whom you have never heard? And how will you hear without someone to proclaim? And how will you proclaim Jesus until you are sent to bring the good news by using your beautiful feet? Now, some people might say, but I have heard of Jesus Christ. I do go to church sometime, and Christ is proclaimed to me then. I experience Christ in the world, and occasionally, 
or maybe even regularly, I do tell my children about Jesus at home. But our ancestors are very old. Those who already believed in God before Jesus walked the earth, they clearly thought that this is not how it works. Faith is the ground on which we stand. Faith is the compass which guides us. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9 contains what is known as the Shema to the Hebrew ancestors. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and of your gates. Faith, just like every life-giving thing, requires constant repetition. I eat every day, I drink every day, I move every day, I sleep every day, I connect with God and people every day. That way, faith becomes part of who I am. And of course, I can rush out to my car with a bread roll in my hand, quickly give a nod to God as I fasten my seatbelt, and connect with my partner by non-handheld phone to organize the day while I wait for my to-go coffee at the stand. Or we could have breakfast together, even on a weekday. Talk in person, pray together as a family, and leave the house at a normal maybe even leisurely pace. You have more choices than you think in regard to how you fill your time. I suggest to fill it with good things, with helpful things, with godly things. God has promised to be with us in word and sacrament. The church is a mouth house, as Martin Luther said, and Paul adds in the letter to the Romans just shortly after our pericope today, so faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. And what we hear on Sundays is not only what we read from the Bible and what I preach here from the chancel, it is also how we all check in with each other at coffee hour and how we learn together at Sunday school come September again. If you only come to church once a year, even once a month, you will miss opportunities to meet up with your peers, opportunities to grow in faith together as community. Online church is great, a wonderful blessing for the home homebound, those who travel, those who live in other places. But it cannot replace the in-person community at in-person church. Taking communion at the rail together, it is just such an indescribable, holy experience. I be honest with you, church is busy too. It's really hard to not fall for busy, 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 the busy vibe which rules our society. Too many things are going on. Too many problems are waiting to be solved. Too many urgent matters to attend to. But you know what? All that can wait on a Sunday morning. It is awesome to take the time to sing all five verses of a hymn, to read all three readings of the lectionary, to listen to the sermon in its entirety, even though you're used to being able to click things away. It's just beautiful to listen to the offertory in peace and quiet, to let God's words work in you, to receive Christ in the bread and wine and take the time to be grateful for God's gift of grace for you. How beautiful are the feet and wheels of those who bring the good news. After church, you take this graceful experience with you as you go out into the world to live your faith in your daily life. 
Maybe you make sure to walk or wheel over to the fence and connect with your neighbor at least once a week to pray and eat with others as often as you can. And should times get busy and stressful, should you feel fatigue and isolation, hold on. You just have to make it until Sunday. And then you can sit in your pew or in our new children's play area and hear the good news, refresh your faith, praise God in song, share the holy meal with your community and check in with your friends over coffee at, and at Sunday school. And you will know in your heart what St. Paul proclaims, that Jesus is Lord. Amen.